Good evening. And welcome to tonight's town hall meeting sponsored by Mayor Lily May and Chief Kimberly Peterson on the topic of policing in our community. We're really happy to have all of you here with us tonight. And just looking at the numbers, we're at almost 190 participants as this meeting kicks off. And as you will hear consistently through tonight, tonight is just the first meeting of what we believe many to come. In a couple of moments, I will turn the meeting over to Captain Sean Washington, who will be our moderator tonight. But before I do so, I would like to go over um, the structure of the meeting and share with participants how they can um, comment and ask questions during tonight's meeting. We anticipate that it'll take about an hour and a half um, for our agenda this evening. The meeting, as many of you know, is on Zoom. It is also being streamed live on the Fremont Police Department's Facebook page, as well as on our local government cable channel 27. And please feel free to continue sharing that information and encourage your friends, your neighbors, family to get online and participate tonight. Tonight's meeting will also be recorded and available following the meeting, again, on all of our social platforms, and we'll be sure to announce those details following. My name is Geneva Bosquez, and I'm the Public Affairs Manager. Um, I'm sitting with Alberto, who you can't see, but know that he's behind the scenes helping to facilitate our Zoom this evening. And we hope to make this as seamless as possible for all of our viewers. Once we begin the question and answer portion of the meeting, each speaker will have approximately one minute to either share a comment or ask a question of our panelists. We ask out of respect for time that you limit the questions as best you can. So what we mean by that is if you've already heard the same question asked, we would appreciate if you would allow other community members to have the forum to ask new questions or follow up so that we can hear as much as we can tonight, because tonight is really about listening. It's a really about you, the viewers in our community who are here with us tonight. We really are here for you. And our panelists will be taking notes throughout the evening and want to have time at the end of, to address questions and their closing remarks. To participate during the discussion, you have a few options. You can type a question in the Zoom chat. You can also raise your hand with the button at the bottom of the screen and then wait to be called on. Or if you're on Facebook Live or watching on our cable channel, or if it's just easier, you can also call our toll-free number. I'm going to take pause and then I'm going to give that number so that everybody can write it down and we will again share it right before we go into our question and comment period. The number this evening is 1-833-430-0037. Again, that is a toll-free line. You will also need a webinar ID to participate with a phone call. The webinar ID is 925 8663-7817. You will need to click star nine to raise your hand to speak via phone. And myself and partner Alberto will be here to see that and then promptly um, include you in the dialogue this evening. I am now going to turn over the meeting to Captain Sean Washington. Good evening, everyone. And welcome to our Fremont City Hall town meeting. My name is Sean Washington, and my, I am privileged to serve this wonderful community. I will be your moderator tonight. My role tonight is to help facilitate conversation and provide an avenue for you to express your thoughts and concerns you can't hear him. to your government. Tonight, I am before you having a range of emotions and thoughts of my own with past experiences as a Black man in America and as a dedicated public servant working as a police officer. I'm saddened that we need to have this meeting in the first place as a result of injustices and incidents of police brutality Apologies. that have caused such angst, pain, and concern in our communities over the years. I understand the valid feelings and deep concern of anger our community has communicated 
utilizing peaceful, nonviolent protests, emails, and phone calls. I understand that the despicable actions of a few criminals dishonoring the police uniform and badge does not accurately portray this noble law enforcement profession. Finally, I am pleased to be part of a city and a police department that is willing to listen and be responsive to its community's concerns. Tonight, if there are times during the comment section, we will break in and allow for comments from our panelists. Please keep in mind that we will not have the ability to address each comment or question we will have tonight. As Geneva mentioned, um, we are taking notes and we will do the best we can to address your comments at a later date. Tonight, I'm pleased to welcome our panelists and distinguished guest speakers from our community. In addition to our panel, we have several other representatives from your government that may speak tonight. I'm pleased to announce we have Mayor Lily May with us, our city manager, Mark Dene, a respected community member, Pastor Brian Murphy from South Bay Community Church, and our police chief, Kimberly Peterson. We'll start the meeting by first hearing from our mayor, Mayor Lily May. Good evening. Thank you so much for everyone and taking the time to join us this evening. We heard from so many speakers yesterday about the importance of being able to express their concerns to us and we had a great participation. And that's what we're hoping to be able to continue today is that conversation with our community. Fremont is fortunate to be the fourth largest city in the Bay Area with an incredibly diverse community. We are very fortunate to have a very active youth engagement programs with building bridges from reaching out to our elementary school students, as well as with um, outreach from our health and human services. We expressed and shared a little bit in the past, we celebrated the 20 the anniversary for our Fremont Family Resource Center where nearby City Hall, we have 23 nonprofits able to gather and work with many programs offering to our community, such as our VTA program, which is our volunteer income tax assistance. And then finally, we also have tonight, in light of the languages and diversity, we also wanted to make sure we had closed captioning because we're home to the school for the deaf and for the school for the blind. We are inviting all of you to join us in this conversation and dialogue because many of you have expressed the concerns or interest in wanting to look at what Fremont's gonna be moving forward. And it has changed. A lot has changed since COVID-19 and how we work, how we educate ourselves. And at the same time, we're having this conversation about policing. And so that's why we're very excited and fortunate to have the first of a series of discussions and have the open dialogue where we can help shape and reimagine what policing will be like in the post COVID-19 and then after these types of discussions. So thank you for taking the time and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you, Mayor May. Next, we'll hear from our city manager, Mark Dene. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, Mayor. And thank you all uh, that are joining us today. Simply put, our nation and region are in crisis, and our community is not immune. Fremont is not immune. And because of that, tonight we plan to start a community conversation about what policing is in Fremont and what it needs to become for us to move forward. It will include us talking about our police department and why is a progressive department, because of all the years it took to listen, to learn, and to adapt. But equally important this evening, if not even more so, is hearing from you and hearing what you want your Fremont police community to be, how you want community policing in Fremont in the immediate future and in the years to come. Now, I don't think any of us think we're gonna figure everything out tonight, but as uh, the mayor has suggested, this is going to be the beginning of an ongoing conversation. And it is one that the highest levels of this city government are committed to having and facilitating. And while it needs to be thoughtful, I believe it has to be done with urgency 
and with a resolve to make us all better. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm very excited to see the numbers continuing to go up on the people who are watching us. And I look forward to this beginning conversation and the ones that will follow. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next, we'll hear from Pastor Brian Murphy from the South Bay Community Church. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the city leadership for an opportunity to speak uh, on as a representative from the African-American community in Fremont and in our nation as a whole. Uh, I am, I'm glad to see that we are having some some intense and necessary conversations about community policing uh, in Fremont and in our nation. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you I, that the African-American community is glad to see such broad support from our community as the nationwide and global protests are, are raising an important topic in our community. Um, I wanna give three framing points uh, as, as I kind of approach this conversation. One is I don't want us to miss the fact that grief is at the core of this issue and at the protest. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge the grief from George Floyd and his family as, as the incident that has sparked this nation, national debate. Um, I want to raise the point that in the last several weeks, the African American community is in a communal grief. We've seen um, Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, all of these incidents back to back to back. So there is a communal grief that is, that is rising up in this community. And, and the second point, it's important to realize that this is not a, a new issue. I, I realize for some of us, we feel like something new is happening. But the reason for the intensity from the community, uh, at least that I represent, is because there is, has been a long history since the birth of our country uh, of, of issues with how uh, Black bodies, Black skin is perceived in this nation. And so for me, it's very important for us to understand that this is not a one incident issue. This is not a rogue cop or a personal moral failure issue. We, we cannot reduce this conversation to that. Uh, this is an issue about community policing, uh, particularly around issues with the African-American community, but those issues span all cultures, all issues. We're talking about uh, the ability to have uh, respect, um, de-escalation abilities, uh, to see each other as human beings with value and worth. Uh, and I think that's what was so critical, and I, I don't want to take too much time, but that's why I think this issue has sparked such great concern. Uh, we saw for over eight minutes that, that there is a psyche, a mentality in this country where, where Black bodies are devalued and dehumanized. Each excruciating minute pointed out, not just a policing issue, but a national psyche issue, but the, real, the reality is community policing is, is the pointy tip. It is, is the manifestation of a larger psyche with the African-American community. And so I would encourage us not to, uh, not to let too many issues crowd and, and, and drown out what I think is the fundamental point of this national and global protest, that there is pain in this community that has been there for a long time. And we are hopeful in this conversation to have new dialogue, new ideas, new solutions as we do this together. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. We really appreciate those comments. Um, Next, we'll have our Chief Kimberly Peterson of our Fremont Police Department. Hi, good evening. I'm Kimberly Peterson. And uh, first of all, I just want to thank you, Mayor and, and City Manager Danae, for uh, pulling this together. And uh, Brian, I in particular want to thank you for um, joining us uh, to provide us a, a perspective because we truly see you as uh, one of our community leaders. So thank you for being here as well. So, you know, going last, um, you're going to truly see that I did not coordinate my comments with anyone else because it may sound a bit repetitive, but the, the first thing I want to tell you is that the opportunity for us here is to listen. It's to listen and it's to do some self-reflection. To do some self-reflection as a profession and as a department, as your police department. It's become increasingly clear to me, and part of that is listening to people in this community like Brian, that this does be a, go well beyond the horrific killing of, of George Floyd. An incident that we universally in law enforcement reject as criminal and not part of law enforcement, not part of acceptable law enforcement. And we share your anger at that. We share your anger 
that this could still be happening because it's not just this single incident or this is not the only incident which has caused this outpouring. And again, now I feel like I'm repeating a little bit of what Brian has said and not nearly as eloquently, but this outpouring of emotion and anger from every corner of America is not just about this. It's about the history of these events over time. It's about the repetition. It's really reopened the wounds of a history of police violence, a history of mistrust for law enforcement and communities of color, and particularly the African-American community. And it goes even bigger than that, even bigger than just law enforcement. It's societal. It's America's history of racial inequity and bias. And so we're here. We're here to listen and to better understand what you need from us so that we can work to be the best law enforcement agency for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And thank, thank you to all our panelists for your opening comments. And before we go into comments from our community, I'd like to just address a few issues, if I could, um, directly towards the police chief. And some common themes that we've heard over the last few weeks and last night at our city council meeting. Last night during the council meeting, um, it came up a few times, the KQED story related to our amendment of our records retention policy. Chief, I'll ask you, could you address this, um, this concern from the com community publicly tonight um, as we move into our public comments? Yeah, thank you, Captain Washington. It's actually a little hard to hear you. Could I, I'm not sure where the mic is. Um, I know you talked about records retention, but. Yes, Chief, is that better? Is that a little bit better? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just muffled, but essentially okay. you want me to address this ongoing conversation around records retention? Was that the? Yes, that's exactly the question, Chief, and I'll try to speak up a little bit more as we go along tonight. Okay. So yeah, this, this keeps coming up. And um, so thank you for giving me a chance to address it and to explain it a little bit further. So I, I do need to um, give everybody a little bit of history of what this is about. So there are laws that govern how long government agencies hold on to their records, whether they're paper or whether they're video records mm -hmm. and how and when to do uh, purging or how and when you can get rid of these records because you can't store records forever. It's not good business practice to store them forever. They take up room, whether they're paper or video files. And so um, there are various laws that govern different records. What we have uh, as a city is called a retention schedule. And again, it's a standard business practice to have a retention schedule. It's a document that outlines the minimum amount of time that you have to keep these various records. So uh, as some examples in Fremont, when we keep, we keep training files, we keep officers training files and the training files have to be kept uh, for as long as they're employed plus seven years. Their personnel file has to be kept as long as they're employed plus six years. Um, internal affairs investigations, if they are uh, internally generated, they are, uh, you have to be kept for two years. And if it's a citizen complaint or something that comes from the outside, those have to be kept for five years. Those are all governed by law. Uh, officer involved shooting documents or records, those have to be kept for 10 years by law. And um, the laws vary, you know, some are government code, some are penal code. Um, you can just go to our city website and you can look at that retention schedule yourself. So when you want to, when you're ready to uh, destroy documents or purge them, there's a process in place. It, it's time for the purging cycle. Um, you fill out uh, the people who are holding onto those records. It could be admin assist assistants, it could be managers. They fill out the paperwork. It's submitted to uh, the head of the unit or the department. We sign it, we send it to the city attorney who also gives it a second review before these can be properly purged. So we've been doing purges since well before my time. Uh, we do routine purges. As things begin to fill up, we begin to purge. They can happen depending on the unit. They can happen monthly, they can happen quarterly, they can happen annually. In 2017, uh, we took a look at our retention schedule and it had not been updated in years. And our city, city attorney's office brought that to, to our attention. 
We were working to update our uh, body-worn camera uh, policy because we were working on a body-worn camera project, updating. We were bringing in body-worn cameras as well as a new uh, video camera system for our cars. And so we needed to update that. So we went through a full update. We did not change already in 2017 the time standard for internal affairs uh, files as well as officer involved shooting files were not changed in 2017. So internal IAs two years, external IAs five years, and officer involved shooting at that time 25 years. And we changed a whole bunch and just updated a whole bunch of those uh, records. If you look at the retention schedule, you'll see how many are, are listed on there. In 2018, we were still in the middle of the body-worn camera project. We were bringing that on. At the same time, um, just in the larger context, 1421 or Senate Bill 1421 was passed in uh, late 2018. And that brought on some new uh, requirements for all police agencies in California. And since that passed in late 2018, effective uh, January 1st of 2019, we now are required to release uh, all documents related to four types of events. So one, I gotta look at my notes to make sure I cover them properly here. Uh, one is officer involved shootings. If an officer fires a weapon uh, at a person, towards a person, we need to release all of those records publicly. Uh, any sort of use of force on a person uh, that caused great bodily injury. Any uh, sustained internal affairs investigation that was sustained for sexual assault while on duty of an officer, that must be released publicly, all of those documents. And then also uh, internal affairs investigations where there's a sustained finding of dishonesty uh, within the workplace. So um, those are the four things that 1421 uh, added to us. In 2018, we also, as I mentioned, we're bringing on the body-worn cameras, trying to figure out how do we manage all of this body-worn camera video. We have to store it for a certain amount of time. And so one of the problems with all this body-worn video is they are huge video files and you, they're extremely costly to save. And so in 2018, we did another update to the retention schedule for two reasons. What we did is one, we decided to align all the retention schedule uh, uh, pieces to the law. So officer involved shootings, the law says you have to keep them for 10 years. We were keeping them for 25. We brought it down to align with the law for two reasons. One, it's very costly uh, to store all that body worn camera video. We can get hundreds of hours from a single event uh, because you can have so many officers present. Plus you have the body worn camera and the in-car video. But the second reason is we knew with officer involved shootings, we would be releasing it publicly putting it out on the public platform. And once we put that out on the internet, we make the assumption that it lives forever out there on the internet. So once we put that out there, we assume it is out there forever, uh, but we still keep the files for 10 years. So I'm not sure, do, do you think I covered uh, all of it, Sean? I'm just gonna ask you. Yes, Chief. I think that uh, there were a lot of points that have been expressed over the last few weeks you covered uh, a, a lot of those points. So I just wanted to have you speak on that because I know uh, hearing from our community that has right. come up quite a bit, so. Yeah, um, and just so. One, one other point I forgot to make. So again, in 2018, we did not change the IA retention. That has remained the same all throughout. We did bring that that one type down, but you know, once we release it publicly, it's yours, it's the public's, so. Thank you, Chief. I think now what we'll do is go in uh, for our public comments. And so um, just making sure our staff is ready uh, for our first speaker. I'm getting ahead not yet, so um, I'll yield uh, to our, um, our staff member who is uh, gonna facilitate that. Thank you, Captain Washington. Um, as we move into the public speakers, you'll notice that we've had to make some, some technical adjustments here so that the sound is better. We hope that all of you viewers at home can now hear Captain Washington a little bit better. And please send us a chat message if you continue to, to see anything or the volume decreases. We really appreciate that feedback. Um, and for those who have already sent us a message, thank you. 
just to remind everyone how you can participate during the comments um, and question period, um, we will really be listening. And so we will likely have multiple speakers, you know, following each other, but we won't necessarily answer questions immediately. Um, our panelists are taking notes. We want to give as much opportunity to the speakers as we can. Um, under the limited time, we have about an hour that we're going to go for, um, for questions and answers. And again, you can either send them into the chat group, you can raise your hand, or you can call in at 1-833-430-0037, webinar ID 925-8663. 7817 and again click star 9 to raise your hand to speak via the phone. So without further ado we're going to go ahead and move in. We see some hands being raised. We are currently at just about 400 participants and our first speaker is Annie. Annie if you can unmute yourself. Yep, I can. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Yeah, I'm calling in as a member of the public to say a few things. First, I'm rejecting the idea that the Fremont Police needs almost half of our general fund money. They got about 44%, which means that the other services and programs that we have aren't going to be getting that money. And as well, we, I reject the idea that Fremont needs more police because more police do not in fact correlate to a decrease in crime. And we also have studies that say reformist measures like diversity training and body cams unfortunately are quite ineffective. So we need to not count on those things and say, yep, we've, we fixed everything. We need to take more, uh, more large steps to invest in programs that prevent the conditions of poverty, which lead to crime. These things which uh, we can invest in include public per permanently affordable housing, community land trust, drug addiction services, community-based food programs, et cetera. And then I understand that you probably will not be answering questions right now, but I'm asking um, where, where can we as members of the public find out Maybe where- your time is up. So thank you for speaking first. All right, next we have Fabiha Zaman. If you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, Chief Peterson, I urge you to be a leader, not just nationally, but globally. Openly support defunding the police. Your own officers in the city council yesterday said time and time again, the police are asked to do too much. So you agree with the prerequisites of defunding the police, but your actions have shown completely otherwise. Disappointingly, I've heard countless times by some on this panel and our own city council members saying that George Floyd's death is only by a few bad actors and won't happen in Fremont, but I encourage you to reach out to Minneapolis police and ask if they ever thought their police was capable of murder. Be proactive before even reacting is too late. Minneapolis tried a lot of provisions in Eight Can't Wait after the murder of Philando Castile, and ultimately they have ended up defunding the police. This movement is inevitable, and this is the way forward. You can either be a leader or stand on the wrong side of history. And Mayor May, show your people, the people that put you in that office, show them the same amount of support that you've shown Elon Musk. I yield my time. Thank you. Uh, next is Kiki. We're gonna have we're gonna go to the next panel. So we're having a technical issue. Pallavi. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, right, thank you so much for taking my uh, uh, questions here. As a resident of Fremont, first of all, I'd like to send my warm wishes to all of our Black community members, and that we hear and we are with you. Um, thanks, Lily, uh, Mayor Lily May, and uh, our Chief Pedersen for doing this. My um, ask for chief police officer here is let's look at our Fremont Police Department's investments and reshape them. Also, um, this is for uh, Mayor Lily May about eight can't wait 
we only have two of the components enabled for Fremont. It would be really great to know what our plans are as a city to align ourselves to all of the eight components and um, make that more transparent and figure out what it is that we need to do as a community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Priya. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I have a few questions. Um, yesterday, Chief Peterson said that um, it would be dangerous to send social workers to handle cases that are related to homelessness because a lot of these cases turn out to be violent um, and social workers aren't trained um, to de-escalate and they don't work 24 seven, but what, what if we create new programs that allow this to happen and why are we limiting our change? Um, and also, why, why do you believe that an SRO is better equipped to handle cases of child abuse or potential suicide risk than teachers, um, counselors, and school psychologists? I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like next we have a phone call. Uh, the last three digits of the number are 291. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my call. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Uh, so I'm a Fremont resident and uh, I wanted to thank the organizers of this uh, virtual session and I'd also like to thank the Fremont police for the work that they do. As a Muslim living in America, I can sort of relate to how the police may be feeling where the actions of a few are associated with the entire community so please don't be disheartened by that. But I would like to ask a question uh, following this comment, which is, I would like to better understand this police culture of drawing a, a virtual blue line where no matter what the cost is, police officers often defend each other and uh, feel that community are against each other or that no matter what happens, the police must defend uh, whatever another policeman has done, whether it's right or wrong. So if you could please uh, talk a little bit about the, the past in terms of where this culture has come from and what this culture means. Thank you. Next is Lisa Doms. Hi. Um, I, first off, I agree with the speakers who have been asking to defund the police, and I agree with the concern that reform is not working. And I think, and I agree with the speaker who was talking about um, other professionals who might be able to do the job better in specific situations, such as in schools and when working with our unhoused community. And I'd like to ask a question, which is um, a follow-up about the police records that were purged. So I work with computers for a living and I absolutely understand that data is expensive and that needs that it can't stay around forever. But that doesn't explain why the 10 to 25 year old data that doesn't contain body cam data because the body cam data is new had to be purged before it was made public. It, you know, the public can do your data retention job for you if you make that data public first. So I think that's why we're thinking that it looks a little bit more like it was hiding the data to cover it up. So uh, I'd like you to speak to that a bit. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Bob. Bynum. Bob Bynum. I'm here. Uh, okay, Hello. great. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, to those who say we need to defund the police, I say we need to radically increase the funding of the police. I realize the need for social workers, but uh, I think this is business of defunding the police is dangerous. And uh, um, I, um, uh, I, I think that we need to increase police funding, maybe in improve training, but uh, this business of defunding the police is, is dangerous. And uh, 
maybe we need to improve abilities to uh, take down suspects. But um, some of these people who are uh, are are getting uh, or getting killed by police have done something aggressive to provoke the police. I mean, police can only withstand a certain amount of stress before they crack. Well, that's my input. We appreciate that, Bob, and I'm pretty sure I recognize that voice from Coffee with the Cop. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, next we have Rada. No, it, let's, we're going to go to a phone number instead. The last three numbers are 557. Five, five, seven are the last three numbers of the phone. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Lawrence. I appreciate um, the opportunity to speak with uh, Mayor May and um, those from the police department, Chief Peterson and Captain uh, Sean Washington. Um, first, I have a quick question. I know that change, positive change, usually starts from uh, up with from the top, right, and with a big uh, with a big group. For example, it's Fremont citizens and Fremont PD's leaders. Um, I know that there's a community uh, advisory group uh, within Fremont PD. Um, I just learned today that some of these members have been there for quite some time. Um, I was hoping that maybe we could, in like, for example, just like I think you mentioned Chief Peterson, the department's records retention, which needed updating, if we could possibly have an update to that community advisory group, the way that uh, members are selected and appointed. Um, I've, I heard that there's no openings currently, um, and I'm definitely interested in that. I myself being uh, currently involved in um, uh, community policing as a peace officer as well in the Bay Area. Uh, Thank with you. Your time is up. We do appreciate your, your input and willingness. Hey, Geneva. If I could just jump in real quick. Uh, Chief, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your um, uh, advisory group. Uh, the purpose of that group um, you know, the composition of that group, just for the callers, we've had a few folks inquire about that over the last couple of days, and I think it'd be good to kind of explain the purpose and intent behind it. Sorry, I think you're muted, Chief. You'd think with all this time with the Zoom, I would have figured this out by now, but sorry about that. Um, Chief Steckler actually started that about 20 years ago, and uh, there are some members that, uh, some of the original members are still on the group. When I uh, took over the role of the chief uh, in 2018, um, one of the first things we did as a group is talk about what is our mission? What are our goals? What is the purpose of this group? And what we worked on together, and of course I don't, I'm gonna pull it up, I'm gonna pull it up so I can read it to you because I don't wanna get any of the words out of place. So the purpose of the CAG or the community advisory group is to bring together a representative cross-section of community perspectives to serve in an advisory capacity to the chief of police by providing input on policy issues, department direction, and prioritization. Board members also facilitate two-way communication between the Fremont Police Department and those we serve. So basically, one of the things after we worked on our mission and our purpose statement is we said, okay, who are we and who do we represent? What, you know, everybody is, you know, a member of several different groups within a community. I'm, I'm of course, a representative of law enforcement, but I'm also a mom, for example. Um, so we did that exercise and we said, okay, where are the gaps? And so from that, we decided we really needed to fill uh, some of the gaps. And so uh, we looked at people who might be able to help us fill those gaps. Um, we added uh, some members of the African American community. We added some members of the Asian American community. Um, one area that, that we still believe is a gap is uh, we tried finding some members of the Sikh community and uh, that hasn't worked out. We need to continue some work on that. And I would eventually like to see us uh, add members of the student community, but over the course of these last few weeks, you know, we've had a lot of interactions with members of, of this, the youth community, and um, I'm kind of rethinking that, and I think that uh, I'm considering actually looking at more of a youth board that we could do a standalone board uh, of youth. So anyway, now I'm going off on, on a tangent. Hopefully that covered that question. 
Thank you, Chief. We'll move on with a few more speakers and then um, we may have another question that is a common theme that I'll ask one of the panelists to address. So our next speaker is Pastor David Kayami. You can unmute, oh, there you go. Yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Awesome. Uh, yes, my name is Pastor uh, David Hayumi, and um, my main uh, topic that I wanted to discuss was um, I think that we need to come uh, together talking to each other, uh, whether uh, you're on the side of, you know, you're a police officer or a uh, city official, or if you're on the side of you're just a community member. Um, I consider myself a, a leader within the community to, to build, build bridges uh, between uh, groups that might have opposing viewpoints. And I feel like we need to develop uh, empathy more than anything else for each other and to realize that uh, both sides see each other as the hero in their story. And this story is a story of two groups of heroes that need to come together and change society for the better. So I think that listening to each other uh, and, and trying to make sure that we're not trying to combat each other, that's the only way that any side will listen is if, if I'm talking to you and I'm talking to Thank you. Thank you. As Your time is up. Next, we have Salvador Grillo. Hi, yeah. Okay. Welcome. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. So, Captain Washington mentioned that there have been a few bad apples that spoil the police name. Police departments uh, have very much a you have my back, I have yours mentality that really disincentivizes members from speaking up to route out bad faith officers. This reminds me of something that I read that says, if you have a thousand good cops and ten bad ones, if the good ones say nothing, it's the same as having a thousand and ten bad ones because their complacency allows for poor behavior to be upheld. As someone that was a part of the Fremont Police Explorers program from 2015 to 2016, I can personally attest to seeing some of this mentality within Fremont Police Department. How will you make changes to solve this problem, and when should we expect to see them implemented? I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next. Next is Jennifer Fong. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I have a couple of questions in regards to all of this. First and foremost, I am a citizen of Fremont. I've lived here basically my entire life, so this is a very important community to me. And my questions will be regarding the SRO program. There are three main questions. First one is, will the SRO program in our high schools continue despite cities like Minneapolis, Portland, and Denver beginning to terminate contracts with the police departments? In exchange for their SRO programs, more social programs are being introduced, such as counselors, therapists, and other social workers. My second question is, if you will not terminate the SRO program, what policies will you implement in order to reduce the disproportionate amount of Black and Latino student interventions? My last question is a bit more bit more on the citywide scale. What policies will be introduced in order to restore public trust in police on the citywide scale, pulling statistics from the Department of Justice's database, California Monthly Arrest Database, and other publicly available databases, the Black and Latino populations in Fremont are under 20%, but the combined arrests make up 47%, and the police people killed or seriously injured by police make up 72%. That is a very high number considering the low population amount. Next is Frederick Cox. Hello. Um, I would like to, uh, to urge you as the leader of the police force to help get involved uh, or to get involved with the uh, with uh, reforms that gives better visibility into the police forces throughout the United States and to also uh, be a leader towards, uh, towards implementing uh, procedures and policies that, uh, that help with good alignment. Because I think part of the problem that we're seeing here is that the uh, system has been aligned in such a way to to help cover up uh, behavior that that is uh, that is considered to be unacceptable and creates this this environment? And by helping provide change and being a leader in that space, you not only build trust within our own community, but help build trust throughout the entire nation uh, with uh, with those types of actions. 
uh, yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Hey, Geneva, if I could um, jump in. This is another topic as far as reform policies and procedures and, uh, you know, the community concerns. So I was hoping, Pastor Murphy, if, if you could take a moment um, from the African-American perspective or from the just the community perspective as a whole, um, provide your thoughts on what it is that, you know, some thoughts of the community on how we can start to initiate reform and adjustments to our policies and procedures um, as we move forward. What are some of the thoughts, concerns, um, and ideas uh, that, uh, you know, you or, or members of uh, your church may have? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just quickly share, uh, again, a lot of people have been having this conversation for a long time in the African-American community. Uh, there's two prerequisites. The first pre prerequisite is that there is an openness and a willingness on, on behalf, behalf of uh, leadership within the police department to have honest conversations, uh, to take a look at, at hard data uh, and some transparency. And so there has to be that, that desire and that and intentionality from, from the police. Uh, the second part has to be, uh, I, I think, a, a really willingness to have intelligent conversation more than platitudes or, or, or extremes. Whatever term you want to use, defunding or reforming, it doesn't matter. The, the reality is that we have to have real substantive conversations about interactions and, and the function and priorities of the police department. The people I've been talking to have laid out a four-part framework that use the acronym HEAT. And it addresses a lot of the questions that I'm seeing pop up. It's questions around hiring, the equipment that's used, uh, processes for accountability and transparency and, uh, and training procedures. Key, hiring, equipment, accountability, training. And so if we, if we take all of these opinions, look at a framework that has real conversation and talks about what are the areas where the police are equipped and, and the best resources, and what are the places where we can build up other community resources or alternatives that don't necessarily use those valuable resources where there's other community resources available? So I'm, I'm less personally less interested in kind of these um, uh, inflammatory statements and getting down to a real structured strategic approach to deal with the issues, look at the data and come up with solutions that make sense and then fund them appropriately. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that perspective. I'm sure your community does as well. Okay, uh, Geneva, you want to take a few more questions? Sure. Um, next, we have Joyce. Hi there. Hi, Joyce. So, according to data from policescorecard.org, a black person in Fremont today is almost 13 times more likely to have deadly force used on them than a white person. Why are we increasing funding for a department that is not doing a good job at protecting all of their people? Why are we putting our trust in a department that according to KQED secretly destroyed decades of police misconduct files from prior, prior to 2018? We cannot reform or use money to improve or put a bandaid on a policing system created by America almost 200 years ago to oppress minorities. We need the budget to be reconsidered and for a portion of the money going to Fremont PD right now, which is almost a whopping half of the general fund, and a portion, uh, that portion of that money to be redistributed to community services so they can help prevent the conditions of poverty that would over otherwise lead to crime. We need to divest in the police and invest in nonviolent alternative emergency response programs that aren't systemically racist. I yield my time. Thank you, Joyce. Next is Isabella Hintzman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bella Hintzman, pronouns she, her, hers. I'm a recent graduate of Kennedy and a registered voter. To go off the pastor's point, I agree with the need for empathy. I have white privilege. I speak out of empathy for the black community and other marginalized groups. We need to defund the police and reallocate that money towards human services reallocate to affordable housing for the homeless or at-risk populations, invest in nonviolent trained responders and not the systemically racist institution that continues to repress and murder minorities. We need funding to go to drug rehab, mental health services, and youth services. Diversity trainings are not enough. 
your performative band-aids lack actual solutions to these community issues. Does the city of Fremont want to be contributing to the nationwide injustice against black people in America, or do we want to be setting an example in systemic reformation? Please pursue defunding the police. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Next, we have a speaker with the initials HK. Hi. Uh, as the pastor said, this is not a rogue agent problem. It is systemic. Individual officers may be good, but our police system is corrupt. I wholeheartedly refute Bob Byman's points. Uh, tasers are just as good as guns to subdue violent sub uh, suspects. And we are not Soviet Russia. Cops should not be able to kill with impunity, especially at a 13 times rate to, to black people in Fremont. We need accountability and we need to be better. How can we give 48% of our city's funding to police when my old high school teachers couldn't even live in Fremont? They had to buy their own supplies. They're fully funding the police and they're not funding education enough. We need to focus on rehabilitation. We need to divert funding from uh, the Fremont Police Department and put it into uh, mental health services and education. As Fremont, we're meant to be progressive and we can make the world a better place. I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think, Sean, if you don't mind me interjecting, I would like to ask um, our city manager, Mark Denae, if you are, um, if you can hear me, I'm sure you're there. Um, we've had a couple of questions tonight about the city's budget, specifically with regards to funding for the, free, the Fremont Police Department. Would you be willing to take a few minutes and recap um, some of what was shared last night during the council meeting? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, you know, our police department budget for next fiscal year is approximately $95 million. Um, but before I even put that in context, remember that means a whole host of folks. Uh, and the majority of that is on salaries. But those salaries are not necessarily all sworn police officers with firearms. Uh, we have a very diversified police department from a disciplinary perspective as well. So we uh, Unlike other police departments, we use an inordinate amount of community service officers. Uh, we have clerical support. We also have analytical support, so non-sworn analysts that help uh, provide uh, intelligence policing uh, and a variety of programs uh, to reduce crime, uh, both in schools and in our classrooms. So we don't just use officers, sworn peace officers uh, with firearms, which is still an important part of policing. Um, but even in that context, uh, you know, 95 million is roughly 44% of our general fund, as one of the speakers have noted. But we also have to remember that our city budget is more than the general fund. Um, the general fund is about uh, 214 million, but our total annual budget is over $520 million, almost a half a billion dollars, focusing on a whole host of things, uh, including the general fund, other special service funds, other capital improvement projects like building community centers and a whole host of different activities. So from a, and I, I really, I understand the point of just trying to focus on the general fund, but this is a city that employs just over a thousand employees uh, and is gonna spend next year over $520 million on uh, this community. And in that context, the police department that is not just police officers uh, uh, represents uh, a little less than 20 or approximately $18 million of that. So now that's not to say we can't have a community conversation to do that differently. But I just want to make sure we sort of ground ourselves where we are. It doesn't diminish the idea of perhaps uh, putting different teams together. Um, and then it's important to understand too that we also have a human services department that makes us very unique in the municipal world. Most cities in California and across the country don't have human services department, but they focus on social service activities, whether it's uh, providing rental assistance or access to mental health services, food programs, and a variety of different activities. So in, in addition to that, as we talked about last night, maybe we could even delve into a little further uh, with our human services director. We work really hard to set up multi departmental teams with different disciplines. So it's not just officers that are going out um, and trying to help our homeless people. 
it's home uh, officers along with a counselor. Uh, and they both learn from each other and they both provide a higher level of service, whether it was a counselor going out or a social worker by themselves or vice versa for a police officer to do that um, as well. So I, I thought I would just provide a, I'm happy, I'm glad to provide a little more context of that. That doesn't mean we can't talk about it doing it differently. Um, that's what the annual budget process is all about and that's what community engagement around a budget process is. But but I do want everyone to understand that uh, the police department only represents 18% of the 500 plus million dollars we're gonna spend next year on our community. And of that 18%, it's not all police officers. So. Thank you for that. And just a reminder that our entire budget document can be found on our website at fremont.gov. Um, and we're happy to help um, anyone who's looking for that to get them the, the, the URL. Um, and we can possibly even post it tonight after the meeting. Um, so let's move to our next um, speaker. Um, next we have DJ. No, I'm sorry, Geneva, just to interrupt, yes. sorry. Yes, go just, ahead. Just one more ad I, I want to point to. I also want to be very clear that you know, the current or the new fiscal year budget that was approved and will go into effect in July did not add more police officers. We haven't added more police officers, uh, I believe, for at least one or two fiscal years. And even at that, it was one or two. So the additions uh, that are made in the police department and frankly, the very few additions that this budget can afford because we're dealing with the uh, aftermath of the COVID crisis and that we are frankly still in, not aftermath. Uh, we had to bridge a $10 million budget to close out our current fiscal year, and we had to br uh, bridge a $12 million budget, or excuse me, deficit uh, for both deficit this fiscal year and a $12 million deficit going into uh, this new fiscal year. So this budget is not filled with choices of adding things. This budget is filled with a whole host of difficult choices to defund a variety of activities, and um, to the point that the especially in the general fund that the PD represents a large portion, there are significant cuts uh, in the police department as well, uh, most notably on uh, overtime, uh, which will limit some of our ability, but uh, the deficits were big enough that everybody has to play a part, and especially some of the larger departments where they be police or fire uh, have to play, uh, play at least their proportional part. So uh, the, the, the police department's budget is not filled with uh, additions. They're actually filled with some a significant reductions. But the additions that have been talked about are a, a permit parking program that we are initiating in a variety of parts in the city to protect our residents. Uh, and it's just, it's not only neighborhoods, it's also some local train stations and areas where our employees commute to and from work without having to drive. Uh, and it's a program that we're initiating only this year for the mere fact that it's going to be able to more than pay for itself. This budget does not have anything in it unless it's somehow going to pay for itself, just given the difficult position uh, that we were in. Um, and we were gonna have to monitor this budget more closely than ever before to see if uh, our projections can hold. And if they can't, there may be even more significant reductions uh, mid-year. Conversely, to the extent um, the economy perhaps comes back faster than we're anticipating or that our revenues are not gonna fall as much as they have, it will be an opportunity for the city council to reinvest those dollars in the things they were used before, or perhaps in other things as well. So again, just information backing, it's not suggesting that we can't have community conversations about using money differently. We really appreciate you taking the time to go into that level of depth. And for those that you know joined in last night, it's I think worth sharing that our meeting last night had the most attendees for a budget um, discussion that we've ever had. I believe we had over 500 participants in the Zoom meeting last night. And so this is clearly an important topic for our community. And so thank you for going into that level of detail. Um, and again, we're happy yeah, to, just, yes? And, and just to add on that, you just uh, triggered another thought for me. <laughs> you know, we work uh, very hard every year to get community engagement in the budget process. You know. For better or for worse, we live in a world or we have lived in worlds that we perceive um, that we're busy with our family or the pursuit of our individual education or our careers or whatever it may be. So it's typically very difficult to engage a community 
in a significant way uh, on a budget process, even though we work very hard to do that, whether it's uh, annual uh, scientific community surveys or statistically valid surveys, uh, holding traditional community meetings. Uh, we've had a product up for a few years called on, uh, uh, Open City Hall, which is essentially an online civic engagement tool where people can use their phones and they can engage with us. Oh, it's disappearing in my background, but uh, they can use their mobile devices to engage with us on the topics that are important to them when they want to uh, do it, whether it's after putting children to bed or finishing homework or getting up early after a run. So this, this city is very committed to civic engagement. And uh, I would just say, frankly say, given the events um, of the last few weeks, uh, we now have a, a whole new group of people who, frankly, may have a different opinion and may, or frankly, may be more interested in engaging in civic government and how we prepare our budgets. And we look forward to inviting and engaging with all those, whether there have been people who've engaged before or if there's just a whole new group of people because of some serious events are now interested in it. That's good for us. That's part of the process. That's part of democracy. And that's part of what administrative people like me and department heads and Kim, we uh, dedicate our lives to. So we look forward to the engagement uh, that people want to have. I can definitely concur with that. Um, DJ Alex Reyes, you are our next speaker. You have to unmute yourself. There you can go. You yes, we can hear you. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, I just wanted to say publicly and openly that I fully support the Fremont Police Department 100%, actually correction, 1000%. I know every police department's not perfect. I know every police department in the agency has problems with violence and other, and other stuff, but I fully support the men and women of Fremont PD. And we must find a way to have great community relations with the community and business owners and other members of the community to coexist as one. Police officers work for us and we work for them. So we always work, watch out for one another. And like I said, I fully support the entire Fremont Police Department from Captain Sean Washington to Chief Peterson, to the city manager, to everybody involved. So thank you all so much for doing a great job. And I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, Alex. We are going to take another caller and then we're going to move to some chat. We know that we have a lot of people sending us messages in our chat group. So um, Samuel Lucero, you are next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, uh, I'm not a native to Fremont. I moved here a couple of years ago from a very red, very rural state. And I have to say for a city with both a female p police chief and a female mayor that this is a very unprogressive city to be in. Uh, to have the audacity to spend over half the budget on police and at the same time refuse to kneel in solidarity for victims of murder is frankly a little bit insulting. And I have to, I just have to voice my disappointment in the current state of events. Uh, over the past two weeks, 2,000 cases of coronavirus pop up every single day. Alameda County just went past 4,000 cases and is one of two counties to have over 100 deaths. And this lack of action on the part of the government is not helping that at all. People are going to continue protesting. People are going to continue calling for change until you actually bring that change about. So I'm just calling for you guys. Please make that positive change for our community. It's dying for you. I yield my time. Thank you, Samuel. And as mentioned, we are now going to move into chat. Let's see, we have quite a few comments in here. That's one second. And this uh, question is, from AJ, um, he is asking, has the police department looked at the website joincampaignzero.org? If not, please do so as the items that are listed there are what the country has asked to be implemented. Thank you for that comment and question. Um, I do believe that we are looking at that. Um, the next question is, what is the use of force policy for the city of Fremont? AJ, 
Yeah, yeah. Do you need a, to, yeah. Oh, are you asking me to answer? Or? You know, I, it would be nice if you would be willing to step in. Sure. Uh, on that uh, Campaign Zero, you know, we only recently became uh, aware of that just recently within the last few days. So I actually have asked my staff to look into that so that we can have a better understanding of, of what's in there. So we have some work to do on that to better understand the methodology that they used. Uh, as far as the use of force, it, it, this is a very long policy. So um, I, I, I'm not going to read you the entire thing, but I do want to hit some highlights. First of all, you know, uh, we talk about the sanctity of life. That is one of the most important things in our policy is that we see the sanctity of life as central to all of these things and all uses of force. We have a duty to intercede. We have a duty to report if you see unreasonable force. And that has been in, I don't know how long this has been here. As long as I've been an officer, both of those things have been in there. That is not new. I will um, just read you a, a little bit but, but because it's like a 15 page policy, but kind of the heart of it. Officers shall use only that amount of force that reasonably appears necessary given the facts and totality of the circumstances known to or perceived by the officer at the time of the event to accomplish a legitimate law enforcement purpose. So that's just regular use of force, okay? The reasonableness of force will be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene at the time of the incident. Any evaluation of reasonableness must allow for the fact that officers are often forced to make split second decisions about the amount of force that reasonably appears necessary in a particular situation with limited information and in circumstances that are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. What's important to know is that this is based on law. This is exact language in the law. We talk about use of force uh, to effect an arrest and reasonableness of force. We go through that and you can find this on our website. If you go to our transparency page, fremontpolice.gov, and you look for our transparency page, you will find our training documents. And this policy is our, our, our training manual. And this is policy number 300. So you can read through this thing yourself. So um, I, I don't wanna read you know, all 15 pages of this thing. Let me move to the deadly force portion though, because I need to read that to you. Oh, we have suspended the use of the carotid hold effective last Saturday. And that essentially brings us uh, in compliance with uh, eight of the eight can't wait campaign. And uh, we just recently uh, released the eight, uh, our response to the eight can't wait campaign. And you can read that uh, again on our Twitter page or on our website. Deadly force is only justified in the following circumstances, and this is based directly on the penal code 835A. To defend against an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person. To apprehend a fleeing person for any felony that threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury if the officer reasonably believes that the person will cause death or serious bodily injury to another unless immediately apprehended. Where feasible, a peace officer shall, prior to the use of force, make reasonable efforts to identify themselves as a peace officer and to warn that deadly force may be used unless the officer has reasonably or has objectively reasonable grounds to believe the person is aware of those facts. And just a couple points on accountability and then I'll wrap it up. Anytime there is any use of force in our department, a sergeant is required to respond to the scene uh, if available. If they're not available for, or if they're involved in it, an outside sergeant will review that use of force. So the sergeant who reviews the use of force cannot have been involved in the use of force itself nor in the decision to use force. So another sergeant has to come in, review the use of force. They, of course, uh, speak briefly to the officers, the witnesses. They speak to the person upon whom the force was used, uh, if possible. Sometimes the person, for example, um, can be extremely intoxicated. That uh, is something that happens on occasion. But they make an attempt to talk to them. In addition, they review all body-worn camera, in-car camera, or any video evidence. And then they make an initial assessment to determine whether it's uh, within policy or not. And then they push that to a lieutenant level who is a subject matter expert. 
and we do the subject that subject matter expert piece um, is new. The lieutenant level review is not new, but the subject matter expert piece is, is new. We want subject matter experts for consistency so that we have the experts in whatever area that is reviewing it. And so that also we can learn from what is happening on the street. If we see you know, issues happening uh, over time, then we can take that issue and we can train it. So that is a piece of our accountability. And then of course we have two internal affairs uh, investigators. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the use of force uh, report is also reviewed at the captain's level. If there are complaints um, or if there are issues, we push it to internal affairs for a full investigation. And we accept complaints from any source, including anonymous, and we take all of those complaints seriously and we'll investigate them. Okay, I've taken up too much time, I'm supposed to be listening. I think that was very helpful and answered a lot of questions, Chief. Thank you. We're going to go back to um, our speakers and we'll take a few more of these. Uh, Sarah Gothier. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, awesome. All right, so I've lived in Fremont my whole life and I'm a city employee. And when we, we're saying defund the police, we're not asking for no law enforcement, but we're asking for it to not exist as we know it today. Policing was never intended to fix all of our societal failures. Crime is predictable. Many of the issues that officers face would be fixed with a reallocation of the nine point, sorry, 96.5 million that you're putting into militarizing Fremont P PD into community programs that will present these crimes that many people feel that we need protection from. This money should go towards resources such as mental health, homelessness, and most importantly, our schools. Um, we need to move into the future, not work to preserve archaic dysfunctional services. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Next is you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I just want to ask how body cameras would be enforced for police and if there are any legal ramifications for police members if they were to turn off the body cameras when an incident occurs. And that, that's my only question. Thank you. Chief, would you like to talk about body cameras? Yeah, if I can unmute myself. Yes, um, so body cameras, they're required to be worn when you uh, walk outside the building, they're required to be on. Uh, so they have to be powered on while you are out in the street uh, working. Um, when you come in the station, it's the only time you can power them off. And the reason for that is because you come into the station to you, you know, use the locker room, use the restroom. So um, we need those cameras powered off in those private spaces. But when you walk out and you go out to do your job, um, those cameras need to be on. When I say powered on, that doesn't mean it is recording, although it is recording silently in the background. So it's it's got a loop on it. Um, I, I believe it, I don't know how many hours it's constantly recording, but when you get to, you are required to turn it on um, when you are going to a call, before you get there if possible, um, or when you're having uh, any sort of uh, work interaction. So you're not required to turn it on and, and start the active record when you're having coffee and somebody comes up and chit chats with you. But if somebody come, runs up to you and says, hey, uh, somebody's breaking into my car, you are required to turn that on. You have to turn it on before you get to a call. Remember, um, it is always silently recording in the background. When you turn it on, it also turns on the um, audio and then, uh, then it will upload that uh, piece that got recorded. But there have been times, uh, there are times where you don't realize and you don't uh, turn it on. For example, you, if you get in a car crash, it also turns on when you turn your lights on. So it will start recording then. So for example, you get in a car crash and you hadn't turned it on. Well, now if you turn your lights on, it will activate the, the active record. The sound will begin to record. And then when you back, get back to the station, that segment will upload and you can tag it. But if um, it also, you can look backwards because it has that silent record in the background. Thank you, Chief. Next is May. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, um, 
Thank you for the panelists and uh, hosting this meeting. I think that I am a resident of Fremont for almost 20 years. Uh, first, I want to remind everybody, we're so fortunate uh, Fremont is one of the safest city around. And then that doesn't happen by accident. We have a very strong police department and very strong community. So I think that we're fortunate, but we do see there's always improvement for any department. So I think that in this time, I will vote for uh, increase the budget, not decreasing, because given the uh, tragedy event happened around the world, around the country, we need more funds to educate, uh, to train the officers, to reach out to communities to solve the issue. So I yield my time. So I, I oppose to decreasing the funding. We should keep the funding or maybe increase. Thank you. I'm going to move to our next speaker, Nancy. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, cool. Uh, hi, uh, I'm a Fremont voter and taxpayer. I'm deeply saddened by the uh, defund police discussion. This reminds me of California Proposition 47. Um, you know that uh, some people think uh, saving money on state per prison and uh, diverting funds to social programs will improve safety of our society. But you can see after four years, uh, with increasing, uh, increasing auto burglary, armed robbery, and home innovation, Fremont is no longer a city that I used to live in. You know, whenever I go shopping, I have to make sure not to leave anything valuable in the car you know, or not bring a purse in case of grab and go. Um, under current situation, if we uh, continue to defund the police, who will protect us? I think right now the most important thing is the gun control and legalizing drugs are a major issue for this country, not the police officer. Um, defunding the police without a contiguous plan to protect the people will be a complete disaster. And the society will become chaotic and lawless. All life matters. They should stand united Thank against the crime, not friends. the police officer. Chuck Shu, hurry up. Chuck Shu, you're muted. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, okay, is there a detailed expense report available to the public? I think points about the general fund versus other funds you paid to issue. If there were more transparency and citizens could actually understand our budget, I think we'd have a lot less questions. So I'm really demanding a detailed expense report. Um, moving on, I have a few questions about police misconduct. First question is, is there a public record of officers' prior misconduct? Second, um, moving into internal investigations, for example, that the sheriff mentioned for um, the use of force, I read online that there's a policy that disqualifies civilian complaints in the Fremont Police Department manual from resulting in discipline if the police take longer than one year to complete the misconduct investigation. This inherently undermines accountability and incentivizes internal investigating units to drag out investigations against the ethics of civilian justice. Can you respond to that? Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next is Paul Kim. Paul Kim. Paul. We're going to move to a phone number. The last three are 604 for our next caller. Yes, um, my name is Patty Beth, and I attend South Bay Community Church. Um, pastor Murphy is my pastor. And um, regarding police reform and accountability, it's very critical. And we need to disband the idea and the practice of qualified immunity for police officers, which is the extreme difficulty in charging police officers with the death of people, more often black men, in the custody of the police officer. And I don't know, you know, in, in many cases, when people like Breonna Taylor are not in the custody of a police officer. This is a practice, and I believe it's a law, um, that really needs to be changed and included in our police reform, um, qualified immunity. 
Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller, we, we still have Paul Kim. Is Paul Kim? The the next caller is has the last three digits of nine five four. Hi, I am Kiki. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. I just like to reiterate that defunding does not mean we will not be protected. And the way to make sure that our community is provided for and is safe, your property is safe, our lives are safe, is to make sure that everybody has enough in their life to live. Nobody's stealing your car if they have their own. Nobody is stealing your food when they are not hungry. So we need to seriously move the budgets into our community. Uh, I have grown up in Fremont and I live here and I don't make enough to live on my own in Fremont. So please, I know that you have spoke about the budget not being uh, as much as, as we think, but you can do better as a police. Uh, the police is rooted as a slavery catch slavery catching um, group. Thank you. We are including a link on both Facebook and the Zoom right now for a direct link to our budget. So hopefully you'll see that pop up shortly. Next is Vivek. Yeah. Hi, um, so I actually wanted to talk about uh, establishing a citizen oversight board for the Fremont police. Uh, right now, there's absolutely no organization that actually disciplines Fremont police officers in case of an external organization that um, establishes any kind of discipline or investigation. This has pre uh, been precedent in many other cities, uh, including Chicago, Washington, DC. Uh, many of these cities have elected uh, citizen oversight boards I see no reason why we shouldn't have this implemented in Fremont. Uh, it provides more accountability, and I think we should uh, do this in the meantime while defunding the police is happening in the background. Thank you, and um, I actually want to yield the rest of my time uh, to Chief Peterson if she want if she would like to answer the question about uh, uh, what Chuck Shu asked a little earlier. Thank you. Um, we were just informed that Paul Kim is having some issues with his um, speaker. And so, Paul, if you would like to send us a message through chat, we will try to find that and um, make it a... Oh, here it is. Okay. Um, this is from Paul Kim. This is in our chat. First, the Campaign Zero statistic about disproportionate treatment of Black people is based off a tiny sample size of five interactions that is too small. Second, what exact conduct does the public want to change, stating we need to make the police less, oops, sorry, less racist is too ambiguous of a goal. Thank you. The next, um, we're going to take a phone call. So the last three of the, or the phone number is 313. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, hi, thank you, Mayor, Mayor, and Council Member. My name is Radha Sharma, and I'm speaking as a private citizen. I'm a resident of Fremont, and as an Indian American woman, I have only positive experiences with the police. However, as these national protests have shown, that isn't the experience that everyone has had in America. I feel that this is an okay first step to have a workshop, but we are missing major players from the conversation. We're missing the city attorney, the district attorney, and public defender's office. And where are the rest of the council members? I fully support Black Lives Matter. And there are new, no two sides to racism. Racism is wrong, period. I would like to have concrete steps established to defund the police in Fremont and focus more on the community and how we can help our residents all around. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Shaina 
Kathari? Um, hi. Okay. Um, so as a resident um, of Fremont and someone who's lived here my entire life and voted here, Fremont desperately needs to be a more equal place. That's something that I realized as I was growing up here. There are vast amounts of inequality in income and opportunities just across different areas of our city. Homelessness in Fremont has increased by 27% since 2017. Meanwhile, police budgeting has increased from 37% of the city general fund, and I'm using the, the general fund because it's a little difficult to figure out what proportion of the total budget it is, um, in 2015 to 16 to 43% in 2019 to 20, and a projected 46% from 2020 due to 2023. Um, what are the reasons for this increase and why can't we put that percentage of our budget towards increasing social services, decreasing inequity, um, instead of towards increased funding for police? Um, what are our tax dollars going towards and why are we increasing funding for the police instead of decreasing it? Um, thank you and there you go for my time. Thank you. And just as a time check, it's 726, and we still have some, um, some participants that are in here with some questions. We're going to try to get through some more of these. Henry Lane. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the. Uh, I just want to remind actually, I uh, was a participant here is in the, in the 2018. Based on the FBI data, Fremont has three murders, 55 rapes, 216 robbery, and 228 assault. And uh, as far, based on my uh, research, majority of the crime actually commit by non-resident of the Fremont. Uh, I'm not sure actually is the solution, defunding actually will help. And also increase the social service will help because majority it was not committed by actually our resident. Uh, that's my point, thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Laura Chen. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, will you please um, commit to saving the questions that don't get answered in this town hall? Um, and publish your comments on them publicly. Also, will you commit to providing a detailed police budget in the proposed operating budget, including breakdown by type of officer, which um, Mark Dinaj had answered. Also, Council Member Shaw had mentioned last night that the budget is open to change during the fiscal year. So will the City Council commit to reevaluating the budget every three to six months with public input? And finally, I would like to point out that you've been answering the questions from some of the citizens calling in, but not from others. So I'd like to echo Takshu's question on why we have this policy that disqualifies complaints from citizens if they're not responded to within a year, because that seems like a pretty important loophole. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Michael. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you very much. I would like to state that I'd like to support the police department. They're, they're in a very difficult situation that they never anticipated. But we also need to understand that while a police department has their regional complex issues, every police officer wearing a badge is amplified throughout the country. What they do in on, on one coast is absolutely amplified to a police department on the other on another coast and everything in between. And we have to be aware of that and come up with a, a statement. Chief, you need to get out there on CNN and, and publicly state that this will never happen. Thank you very much. I yield my time and look forward to working with you in the future. Goodbye. Thank you. We're going to take just a couple of more. It's 7.30 right now. Um, Melissa Lynn. Okay. Um, 
Basically, this is a call out post for that one dude, Bob, and everyone else who thinks the police deserves money. Defunding the police isn't actually about eliminating them, but about recognizing the role they play in society as one that they should have never even been given and definitely shouldn't continue to have in the first place. Our country has basically taken all of our most pressing social issues and handed them over to the police to have them fix them with force. We're facing a crisis with affordable housing, drugs, public education, and so many more. Defunding the police is about actively recognizing that if we took away from the police every public issue that they never should have been given to fix, that the police would literally have nothing to do because we basically made them glorified social workers with guns. Fuck y'all and I yield my time. <laughs> Next, we have a caller with the last three of 387. John Hines, I would like the chief to comment on some recent developments in Seattle and how they might be instructive for us here. What happened was that two days ago, a group of self-styled revolutionaries took over several blocks of the city, including a precinct police station, while the area often proclaimed themselves to be an autonomous country. Yesterday, they were loudly touting the idea that they had become a police-free zone. Today, the reports are that a fellow with a small armed gang behind him has begun setting himself up as sort of a warlord and has become threatening and roughing up other residents of the zone. So the question for the chief is, are there any lessons for us in this on what happens in a society that becomes a police-free zone? How does that vacuum get filled? Thank you. Thank you. And um, Mayor May, are you, can you hear me? And um, would you be able to weigh in on how schools are funded? There have been some questions tonight that we have heard with regards to the funding of schools. Could you explain that for us a little more? Sure, so I'd be happy to send some documentation. So just to first clarify, um, both myself and Council Member Shao, um, have had the opportunity to serve both on the school board as well as now on city council. And the oversight for the schools is something entirely separate. And so when many people are asking us also about the SROs, those are a contract coming from the school board. And so if there was some concerns, they should also um, feel free to express those to the school board themselves because they're the ones who are contracting the services with the city. But the funding from the school board uh, for the schools are coming in a separate bucket in terms of the property taxes that go up to the state and then they're allocated. And during the time period I was there, they, they've modified some of the formula by which the schools are being funded. And so um, it's a little bit longer and more complex than for me to be able to go through right now. But needless to say, it is entirely separate funding mechanism. And so I'd be happy to provide those links and to be able to provide that detail to understand why um, these are separately governed entities and that the fundings are not intermixed. And um, we could also then share, and I know Suzanne Shenfield is also on the line, that some of the information we mentioned earlier last night, I know that having served during a period when there was a lot of budgetary cuts, one of the programs that we did keep were the counselors at the schools. And so we, uh, we'd be able to provide some of those links and details into that information. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor May. Um, we're going to go into a few more questions. I think we'll take about two more. Uh, Nicole Lee. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, I'm Nicole, and I've lived in Fremont my entire life. Reform is not working, and the funding that police currently has should be getting towards education for future generation, generations just like me. When we say defund the police, we do not mean advocate. We actually do mean advocating for a divest and invest model where we instead use our funds for welfare services, social workers, and homelessness, and mental health programs. We are not asking for the Fremont police to be to get off to be stopped but rather change how they enforce lily may i know you and i'm disappointed for not kneeling you would have think that the discrimination that we have faced used as scapegoats for covid19 would make you understand how the black community faces on a day-to-day -day basis all fremont police officers must be held accountable for their fellow officers actions i yield my time 13 12. thank you and this is going to be our last um Rupa Jit 
Hi. Okay. Okay. So, hi, my name is Rupjeet Singh, and I was born and brought up in Fremont, California. I went to school here since kindergarten. I mean, I just wanted to say, like, you know, the police is, in a, is effective in a lot of ways, but in some ways, it's not always the case. So, I wanted to give an example from last year, where there was a mentally ill young man named Christian Madrigal, whose parents called the Fremont police to help on June 10th, 2019, when he had a mental health crisis. His family needed help to, you know, take him to mental health facilities. Instead, police arrested him, and then they choked and beat him, and he was taken to jail where he died. So my question is, in some cases, isn't it better that, you know, if we have, you know, the police has a more narrow scope of function? Because in this case, clearly this could have been avoided, and, you know, he had a mental health crisis, and I just feel like our funds can be like allocated more effectively than they are right now. Thank you very much. I yield my time. Thank you. Um, we know that we have more attendees with some more questions and we'd ask that our attendees um, add their questions to the chat um, since we're not going to be able to get through um, everybody's comments and questions this evening, but we will review all of the questions in the chat and try to post answers in the upcoming days um, to all of those. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it back over to Captain Sean Washington. Thank you, Geneva. Thank you all for those comments. Um, like Geneva said, we're taking notes and um, we will try our best to uh, answer some of the comments, questions, and concerns that you have. We're going to end with uh, some closing comments from our panel members, uh, starting with Mayor May. Mayor? Sure. So thank you very much for everyone for taking the time to come and share your thoughts. The purpose of today is only the beginning of the discussion and that we're hoping to be able to invite you to work with us as partners in the community to reimagine what our community policing will look like. What we were hoping to do and we hope to continue to do is we wanna hear from you. We wanna hear your stories and the reasons why that you are expressing your concerns and what you'd like to see in the partnership. So I just wanted to say thank you again for the time. The video from today will be posted and then we'll be able to get more discussions and hopefully more community outreach in areas that would be of interest to all of you. And in particular, I know some of the questions that have come up have pertained around healthcare and social services. And so I will be also reaching out to the county and other areas that do provide those services and that we can maybe join in some additional dialogue to clarify where those programs are being funded and how we can work together to ensure that whether it's through measures or oversight, that we can have more of those services being delivered to South County and in particular to Fremont. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor. And now we'll hear from our scene manager, Mark Denae. Yeah, I too wanna to thank everybody who participated today and give you our commitment that we'll do our best to answer uh, any of the unanswered verbal questions, as well as uh, those that had to be put in the chat. Um, I, I think one of the reflections I'm taking away from this is the, the comment that Pastor Murphy said that I, I know was his own thought as he was expressing it to us, but I, I think I, you can see it in the commentary and the questions that we heard, which is that this is something different. Uh, while this is something our country has continued to talk about before and many times, somehow it is touching us even differently and to a greater degree uh, for our own good, whether it's in our country or, or internationally. So I really uh, appreciate his participation and his sort of context setting that I think was reflected in a lot of the feedback we had and, and the need to have an open um, and a conversation and a willingness to look at real data, uh, a willingness to have an intelligent conversation where we don't necessarily uh, focus on inflammatory comments or frankly even platitude answers to some of those questions. And so I look forward to, to learning more about that uh, and moving this forward. And again, I want to share with you um, that we, you know, from the outset said that we weren't gonna figure this all out tonight, or at least I did, uh, but that we're gonna begin, this is the beginning of a conversation and it's one that we're committed to facilitating, but at the same time, it's one that needs gonna require urgency and resolution. This isn't something we're going to just do over a period of time. It's something we're going to have to start over a period of time and start delivering some new uh, 
opportunities for the city, new opportunities for positioning this police department. And then I also uh, finally look forward to uh, uh, perhaps some new people who are, are engaged in what uh, our local government does and start playing a role in uh, helping us decide how the city council should allocate these limited resources. So thank you for everybody for your participation. Thank you, city manager. And now we move on to Pastor Brian Murphy. Brian? Uh, I just am excited about the comments that I've seen, uh, issues around mental health, um, the militarization of police, uh, the, the perception of a lack of transparency and accountability, uh, our, our youth and children. Uh, great insights, great questions, tough things to wrestle through. Um, I, would, I would encourage us that, that the perseverance to stay with this conversation is what's really critical. My, my hope and my fear is that it's not 60 days from now when this is no longer in vogue or on the news that our, that our um, enthusiasm about this issue and the need for this uh, doesn't wane. Um, and then the last comment, I'll echo something that the city manager said, uh, that we are in a situation of, of choosing priorities and, and money follows the priorities. So what we really need is a conversation about our cultural and societal values. Uh, there's a quote that I'll leave with that's been said by, attributed to Gandhi, Jimmy Carter, several other people that, that the uh, measure, true measure of a society is how it treats the most vulnerable and weak parts of its citizens. That's the conversation that we really need to make a character and value decision around and let our priorities flow from there. And I'm glad to be part of the conversation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for joining us uh, today. It's been really, really helpful. Okay, we'll conclude our final comments with uh, Chief Kimberly Peterson. Yeah, first of all, we're really sorry that we didn't have the capacity to answer all of these questions. There were hundreds of them. And, um, you know, we really, as we said at the beginning, this was intended as a listening session. But I am going to tick through a couple of these that I can just hit really fast so that I can answer some of these I saw over and over. Uh, well, first of all, we, there is 100% did not choke or beat Christian Madrigal, and we have video evidence. Uh, the eight can't wait document you can find that on twitter or our website if we if officers are turning off body cameras first of all there are a couple of exceptions for example if they're interviewing a victim of sexual assault who doesn't want to be videotaped we would turn it off however your to your point if somebody was turning it off intentionally so that they weren't recording whatever came next um, we would investigate that and that is outside the policy and we would uh, apply progressive discipline to that you asked if there was legal ramifications. Um, th this is governed by policy and not by law. Uh, citizen complaints are always investigated within one year and we aim for 90 days. Police unions are a separate entity from the police department and, and PD management in the sense that we uh, can't designate how, how they donate political contributions. And of course that brings up a much larger a conversation about political contributions um, that we can't cover here. Budget documents are available on our city website and they do have in-depth spending information on the city of Fremont, fremont.gov website. Crime stats are on the police department's website, fremontpolice.gov, and we do not participate in the 1033 uh, program. We do not accept uh, military equipment uh, from the, we do not accept militarized, uh, military equipment, pardon me. Okay, so I got through that list. I thought I could at least tick a few of those uh, answers off to you. I just wanna say that, you know, thank you. And we are listening. And uh, as some before me mentioned, this is really just the first in the conversation. It's the first step. It's humbling and it's difficult to hear some of this feedback, but hearing tough feedback is an important part of trying to get better. And we want to be the best. And so we need to hear this feedback so that we can look at where we can improve uh, in the interests of serving our community to the best of our ability. But we need to do more. And so my commitment to you today is that this will not be the end of the process. Um, we need to hear more specifics, uh, sort of like what Brian was talking about and coming up with an outline of what exactly is it you want more of or less of, um, how, what is the framework that um, we want to author going forward so that we can meet your needs if we are not reaching, if we're not achieving that now. 
So I think what we need to do is move forward and figure out how to get together with smaller breakout groups. I don't think it will work with 450 people. We need to look at the various stakeholder groups. So for example, we need to meet with the faith-based groups. We need to meet with groups of Asian Americans. We need to meet with groups of African Americans, um, people from different communities within our um, city. We need to hear directly from you. So my commitment to you today is that uh, we are gonna work on a process to set that up. What would that look like to have those smaller conversations and how could we then work from there? So what I will commit to doing today is uh, within the next six weeks coming back to you. Um, I will work with some stakeholders within my community uh, advisory group, within my agency of course, within city leadership, but we will also reach out to other uh, community leaders and figure out what would that process look like. Uh, I think the youth group is would be an important piece of that. And um, we will come up with that process and we'll come back to you within six weeks to show you at least how that process will look of those smaller um, community conversations. And then after we do those conversations, we will take that information and work to frame up uh, what it is you would like to see done differently. Is it in our hiring? Is it in our policy? Is it in our training? What is it we can change uh, so that we can move forward together? Thank you and uh, very much appreciate the, the chance to connect with all of you. Thank you, Chief. And once again, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our community. And thank you to all of those that are listening outside of our community for coming together and engaging in productive conversation about how we can affect change. We're gonna do our small part in Fremont to help lead the, lead the law enforcement profession as we move forward. With that, um, Geneva, I'll, I'll ask if there are any final um, comments that you have before we conclude for tonight. Uh, just as a reminder, tonight's um, meeting is being recorded and we will get that posted as quickly as we can um, to our YouTube channel and then we'll try to get it onto our website, fremontpolice.gov. You can also watch it again on Facebook. Um, and my, you know, my final concluding comment is that, you know, this Zoom is working as best as it can, but I can't wait until there's an opportunity when the restrictions have been lowered and we can get back out in our community and have face-to-face -face conversations um, like we used to. I mean, that's the heart and soul of what our department has been about, and I really look forward to that again in the future. In the meantime, we're going to continue to use, um, you know, to be safe and use Zoom. So again, appreciate everyone who joined us tonight. Okay. Good night, everyone. Please be safe.